So, in order to actually let you do what we've just seen with the spaceship thing, you know, the ability to fly around and make it have inertia and gravity and all this kind of stuff, I'm going to have to teach you a bit about how to do that. And uh, just the general term for that kind of stuff, that kind of basic physics, is called dynamics. So that's what this part of the lecture is going to be about. So, how many of you have done like basic physics? You, you know, you do it at kind of high school, don't you? You kind of know basic Newtonian dynamics. Anybody not really have any physics background at all? Anyone not take physics? No one is admitting to it, so hopefully you'll get through this. this is, if you know about physics, this is mostly revision. Um, okay, recognize this guy? Yep, all right, well, that's Newton, that's what he looked like. Um, and he invented all this stuff, well, not invented, discovered it, it existed before him, right? Um, so discovered it. So back in 1687, he published the original three laws of motion that basically explain this stuff. The first of which was that uh, every body or every object persists in its state of rest or uniform straight motion unless acted upon by an outside force. So that's sometimes called the law of inertia. So that's just that uh, in the absence of forces, whatever they are, things just keep going. Uh, so if they're stationary, they stay stationary, and if they're moving, they stay moving. Remember the spaceship that once it was moving and I took my hands off the keys, it didn't grind to a halt because there's no friction, it just kept moving. And that's that's what Newton was saying there. He was saying that, you know, people you, before that people used to think that when you, when you push something, you were kind of giving it some motive energy and the energy would run out, it would dissipate as it moved. But Newton said, no, that's only because there's stuff like friction getting in the way. But if you took the friction away, things would keep going forever which was kind of a novel idea. So that was the first law. Uh, the second law is the alteration of motion. Now, when Newton was talking about motion here, he, he must have meant momentum, actually, which is mass times velocity, right? Um, the alteration of motion is proportional to the force and is made in the direction of the applied force. Um, this, of course, is the, the English translation of what was originally written in Latin, uh, but this is basically what he was saying. So this was the, 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 the momentum of an object changes by the force that's applied and the direction that the force is applied. That's the second law. Uh, then the third law, oh, uh, I'm keeping that a secret till later. If, if you already know it, then good for you, but I'll build up some suspense. Right, so we'll get two laws that I'm going to tell you about to begin with. And it turns out those two laws are just one law, which is that. The second law, the one about, you know, momentum being varies proportionate to force. That's the one that we translate mathematically as F equals MA. Um, <clears throat> the idea is that MA is mass times acceleration. Acceleration is change in velocity. So this is actually change in mass times velocity. Mass times velocity is momentum. So this is change of momentum, right? MA is actually change of momentum. And what he's saying is the change of momentum equals the force. Um, Turns out, as I, as I say, that's what the second law is translated as. It implicitly includes the first law. The first law is about what happens if there is no forces. Well, if there's no force, then this bit's just zero. And assuming that masses are constant, which we will assume, uh, then there'd be no acceleration, which means things would maintain their constant velocity, right? So it turns out the first law is, is redundant. The second law uh, already tells you enough that it includes what the first law says. And as I say, they, they both just say F equals MA. Uh, so that's it, and that's that's like that's that's dynamics right there. Okay, you just if you know F equals ma and you understand a little bit about where forces come from, um, you can you can do things. There's actually a subtlety though that on its own, just saying F equals ma is actually not very instructive. This was pointed out by uh, my old friend Richard Feynman. He once pointed out that the F equals ma in isolation is really just a definition. Because it's like we sort of know what masses are and we know what accelerations are. We can measure them. We've just defined this new thing called a force that we've suddenly kind of pulled out of nowhere. And that and it's like there aren't, there aren't any problems that you can answer just by knowing F equals MA on its own. Right? Uh, really, all that does is it defines force in terms of things that you can measure, like mass and acceleration. Because the only way we know about forces is we look at masses accelerating and you can say, ah, there must have been a force. And it's like, well, okay, but... So what, you know? Um, this is actually a link to the, the Feynman lectures where he talks about these things. Um, but the thing I want to just remind you of is that F equals a, MA on its own is not really useful because it doesn't let you predict anything. It, it's just a way of defining a new quantity in physics called force. And we've said, we've said that this thing, mass times acceleration, is interesting. 
and we're, and we're going to want to talk about it and we're going to call it force. Um, so this is me basically uh, paraphrasing Feynman. Uh, one can sit in an armchair all day long and define words at will, but to find out what actually happens when stuff happens, like balls collide with each other or weights hung on a spring, um, these things are, are outside of definitions. F equals M doesn't tell you the answer to what's going to happen if you, you know, swing a pendulum, right? Uh, it's the beginning of something, but it's not it's not the end of something. Um, as a way of illustrating this, Feynman said, you could say that there's a thing called gorse. You could invent something called gorse, and you can say that if an object um, is moving, it's because there's a gorse acting on it, and gorse is the rate of change of position. And it's like, yeah, you can define that all you like, but it doesn't tell you anything about the real world. Um, it, it's just a definitional game. Um, so this is an interesting thing to bear in mind. So that would be an analogous to F equals MA, and it would actually, in practice, not be useful. The trick is that F equals MA is useful because there's a bunch of other stuff uh, that we can actually find out where forces originate in the world, and we can come up with laws that tell us what, what forces are being generated in a collision or something like that, and then you can do the F equals MA part to work out the accelerations that would result. Uh, so, so we've done uh, Newton and Feynman, uh, so we'll complete the trio with uh, the Doctor, uh, the 1980s incarnation. I don't know if any of you know what Doctor Who was like in the, back in the ancient days, but the 1980s Doctor, played by Peter Davison, uh, was for some reason a fan of cricket, uh, to, the, to the extent that he didn't have a sonic screwdriver, because that was like overpowered, so they wrote the sonic screwdriver out for a while. Uh, and instead of that, he had a cricket ball that he would carry around in his pocket for no good reason. So that was his uh, that was his magic object. Don't yeah, know why. Celery, he had a stick of celery. And a stick of celery as well, which was also ridiculous. I think the celery was supposed to detect poison gas. <laughs> uh, it would turn purple under certain... But it was Yeah, that was very silly. Anyway, 80s Doctor Who was very silly in lots of ways. But here he is. Uh, the reason I mention it is because it, it, it actually pertains in a very contrived way to what I'm talking about. So this is an episode where he's, uh, he's floating out in space, rather unfortunately, and the TARDIS is over here, and uh, he's just kind of floating neutrally. He's been, he's been kicked out of the airlock of a spaceship, and although there's a, an attachment cord, it's been, it's been taken away. So the problem is, he's out in space, and apparently this is like a breathing system that's going to run out. I know it's not very convincing, but, you know, it was the 80s and the BBC budget. Um, anyway, the point is, the Doctor's out floating in space, um, and, uh, and he can't get to where he wants to go, which is over here. And he's about to illustrate the third law. This is the one that actually makes Newton's laws become useful. Does anyone know what the third law is? Every reaction has an equal and opposite reaction. Every reaction is equal and opposite reaction. See, now, now you're actually learning something, because now you're actually saying something about the properties that forces actually have. And this is the law that says forces come in pairs, that when you push something, uh, it pushes you back. And the, the magnitude of the force is the same, but the directions are different, and that's important. So the third law is that to every action, there is always opposed an equal reaction, and the mutual actions of the two bodies are, are equal but contrary. So it's you know it's it's the forces have got counter forces and uh, in the opposite direction, um, and that means that if you ever find yourself trapped out in deep space, halfway between the alien ship and your TARDIS, what should you do to solve the problem? Throw away the damn cricket ball. And that is, in fact, what he does in this episode. So you take the cricket ball and you throw it away, right? So you're applying a force to the cricket ball to make it go that way. And it applies a counter force to you. You know, the, the reaction force, basically the, uh, you know, what is it like when you fire a gun, you know, the recoil, right? So you throw the cricket ball away as fast as you can. Um, and the, the same force, but in the opposite direction, applies to you. So you start moving backwards. So the thing is, the TARDIS is over here. So you take your ball out and you throw your ball that way, and then you will counter-react that way and move towards the TARDIS. Uh, what, in that episode, what the Doctor did, he actually did two things. One is he, he threw the ball away, but also he threw it towards the spaceship. So when he throws it, he gets a little bit of a kickback, and that, in theory, would have been enough. But also the ball then hits the spaceship, bounces off the spaceship, comes back, and then he catches it. And when he catches it, that's uh, more momentum, and that pushes him even further. He's basically stealing momentum from the spaceship and that propels them uh, into the TARDIS, using the third law, which I thought was impressive when I, when I saw it when I was, you know, eight. Um, okay, so that's, a, that's reaction forces, um, which is how the spaceship thrusts, by the way. Like, uh, you know, the way 
when a spaceship thrusts, what it's doing is it's it's throwing some matter outside of itself. It's it's throwing away a cricket ball, and it's the counter force of that is what pushes the spaceship forward. Basically, the spaceship's just throwing junk out the back, and when you throw junk out the back, that creates the counter force. Remember, it's not pushing against air or anything like that because there is no air out in space. So it's uh, it's just simply throwing matter away, which creates a counter force that makes the spaceship thrust. All right, so uh, gravity. If you drop a one kilogram weight and a two kilogram weight, how much faster does the two kilogram weight fall? It's holding them here and letting them go. Anyone? Yeah, they should fall at the same speed. It's a trick question. Uh, how much faster? None faster. Right? Uh, it's not the way it works. Um, but it turns out that uh, people have got um, an intuition about this. You probably know this yourself, right? You kind of, if you were holding like a light object and a heavy object, part of you sort of thinks that if you let go, the heavy one would fall faster because it, it feels like it's pushing you more. And it is pushing you more, right? The force that it's putting on your hand is higher. But it turns out it's also more massive and the two cancel out. So the force of the, the two kilogram weight is like a 20 newton force. The one kilogram is a one newton force, right? So you get 20 newtons of force, so it feels like it's pushing harder. And you kind of, most people think that if you if you let them go, that one would fall faster. But it doesn't because it's also got more mass to shift. So the 20 newtons are being applied to two kilograms of mass and it exactly cancels out. So it accelerates towards the ground at 10-ish meters a second per second. And so does everything, right? Everything sort of falls at the same rate if you ignore air resistance. So that's something that's true, but a lot of people... It's not. It's kind of counterintuitive to them until you get taught it. And in fact, you know, the claim is that until Galileo, people didn't really realise this was the case. That people did think that heavy objects would fall faster than light ones until he famously, you know, allegedly did the experiment, went to the uh, Leaning Tower of Pisa and dropped two things. It's probably a slightly made-up story, but it's an illustration um, of of the idea. Um, it turns out that uh, you can actually. You know, you can use computers to teach this kind of thing to kids. I maybe won't, I won't show all of it, certainly, but um, this is a, a lesson that, that, again, Alan Kay likes to do with kids, where he, he gets them to do the experiment, where he, they drop uh, a number of weights from, like, a wall or something like that and just film it with a video camera and, and, take, and take frame grabs of it so you can actually see the, the measure the distances that things really fall. Um, maybe show you a little bit of it. Yeah, so this is like looking at uh, increasing acceleration of a car. You get a visual pattern. And this is in a very simple programming language for kids that he developed that um, is kind of an extension of the, the ideas that he's been working on. So by the way, this, this car moving here, accelerating, is just like what your spaceship would do under gravity, except your spaceship goes down the way instead of across the way. Right? Um, so this is what we're, we're getting into. Of what these nine-year-olds called acceleration. So how do the children do science? Objects that you think will fall to the earth at the same time. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Both hands. Oh, do not pay any attention to what anybody else is doing. <laughs> Stopwatches. What do you get? What'd you get? Stopwatches aren't <laughs> accurate enough. Oh, okay. So put sponge balls. Do the shot put and the sponge ball because they're two totally different weights. And if you drop them at the same time, maybe they'll drop at the same speed. Drop. So obviously Aristotle never asked a child about this particular point because of course he didn't bother doing the experiment and neither did St. Thomas Aquinas. And it was not until Galileo actually did it that an adult thought like a child only 400 years ago. We got so you know, that's science, right? Where you actually do experiments and shit. Um, so we're talking about gravity. Now it turns out the actual force law for gravity and it's a fuller form is, is a little bit, it's not complicated, but it's not trivial. The real law is 
you work out the gravitational force between two masses, mass one and mass two, and I'm hoping you kind of know this, right? But it's uh, proportional to the, the product of the masses and inversely proportional to the square of the distance between them. So there's a big universal constant called G. It's just a magic number that the universe has got programmed into it somewhere. Uh, that number multiplied by the two masses divided by the square of the distance between them, and that tells you the force between you know two like big objects in space or something. Um, which is actually a very strange claim, right? I mean, this claim seems to imply that every every piece of matter in the universe, you know, every planet, every star, every atom, every every can of uh, energy drink, uh, um, that they're all attracted to each other with this gravitational force, which is really kind of extraordinary. And to me, begs the question of how do they know? Right? It's like how do they all know what everything else is to calculate this? Um, it's actually it's really a very strange puzzle. The gravity is like a really weird idea, um, and this force apparently is like instantaneous and operates the limit of distance. Or at least that's what Newton thought. Right? Turns out Newton was a bit wrong. The real laws were complex in this. Einstein figured out a different explanation that involves space-time curvature, but that's also really strange and hard to understand. But it's maybe slightly more rational than the idea of uh, everything sort of somehow magically knowing what everything else is. What happens is that objects deform. The, the geometry of space-time, and an object is then in space-time and can feel uh, what we think of as a gravitational force. Anyway, it's all very weird stuff, uh, and as I say, it's, it's not entirely accurate. This is this is the Newtonian version. The Einsteinian version corrects it in ways that only matter under very extreme circumstances. Um, but. Often and in games and in most of life, we tend to really just think about gravity near the surface of the Earth, which turns out is even simpler. Luckily, uh, makes life a bit easier. Um, when you're near the Earth, the Earth's got a radius of uh, what is it like about six thousand kilometers, something like that. Um, and uh, and remember the, the the important distance is the distance to the centre of the object, right? So when you're dealing with the Earth. Uh, the gravitational force depends on your distance to the centre of the Earth, which is going to be like 6,000 kilometres. And even if you go up another 100 metres or something like that, it's still basically 6,000, right? The point is, anywhere near the surface of the Earth, the distance is, is so near to being the same that you can just treat it as a constant. It, it's only a very small difference. So uh, it turns out the, the R part of it also becomes a constant for things that are just near the surface of the Earth or near the surface of whatever planet you're worrying about. Um, and that's why it turns out that on near Earth, you can, the gravity equation just simplifies to force equals mg, where g is the, the, the local gravity constant, the one that we've got near Earth, the one that's about 10 or 9.81 right, meters per second per second. Um, you can actually calculate that this is correct, by the way, if you care. If you look at the, uh, the, the grown-up gravity equation, the magic number for, for gravity just happens to be this. 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11. That's it's like a very small number. Right? The gravitational constant is very small. It turns out gravity is actually a very weak force. You maybe don't think of it as a weak force because you know it's conspicuous in life that it acts on objects and it's certainly having an effect. But that's only because it's got the power of a whole planet behind it to amplify it up. But in, in absolute terms, the force is very small. One funny thing to think about is if you take the Again, slightly, probably slightly made up story of Newton under the apple tree, you know, where the apple fell on his head. When that happened, which I mean, it can happen, it probably didn't really happen to Newton, but anyway, uh, when an apple falls from a tree, what's happened is the apple has just got big enough that the gravitational attraction of the whole planet Earth is large enough to snap a tiny twig. So actually, gravity is a weak force compared to the chemical forces that hold twigs and other objects together. Very strange. So anyway, but this is the gravity constant. This is the mass of the Earth, quite a large number, and this is the distance uh, in, in meters, the radius of the Earth. So those are the like, the real numbers. Um, you put this into the equation uh, to to get like you know gravity near the surface of the Earth, and it's just g times mass of the Earth over r squared. By a strange coincidence, these numbers are very cancelable. Uh, you know, the g happens to be 6.67, and uh, and we've got a uh, what have we got? Uh, Me is 10 to the 24. So you get 10 to the 24 and a 10 to the minus 11. So that becomes uh, 10 to the 13, like that. So that's the top part. The bottom part's r squared. That's 6.4 times 6.4. This becomes 10 to the 12, right? 
But if you look at it, the six and the six, they, they cancel pretty nearly, and so do these ones. Like this one's slightly bigger, and that one's slightly smaller, and it all just kind of goes away. Right? So the sixes almost all cancel out, and you end up with 10 to the 13 over 10 to the 12, which is 10 to the 1, which is 10. So just roughly speaking, you can see that, that gravity, the local force of gravity, acceleration near Earth, is about 10. If you use my numbers, you get 9.77. If you use like, totally precise numbers, the real value is 9.81. So this is this is why acceleration near the Earth is what it is. Um, okay, so gravity is a bit of a mysterious force. I'll just mention. So when you're doing like a physics simulation, you you need to know F equals m a, which tells you once you've got a force, what accelerations will it cause on the objects that you're dealing with, and then you need to know where are the forces coming from. And the forces can come from things like gravity. Uh, collisions cause forces. Um, you know, if you got like a things you know, attached to a pendulum and elastic behind, they're all causing forces. Uh, magnets they cause forces. It's a complete mystery. Nobody knows why. Um, so what we've learned so far is that forces get applied to bodies. Um, F equals m e doesn't tell you where they come from, but separate investigations looking at gravity and collisions and so on tell you that they arise from bodies hitting each other or being gravitationally or magnetically attracted. And when you've got a bunch of forces acting on an object, the trick is you add up all the forces, because like an object might be under the gravitational influence of many other things. You just add them all up, you get a final force, and then you use F equals MA to let you calculate the acceleration that results from that force. Right? That's what you do. And we know that acceleration is the rate of change of the velocity, and we know that velocity is the rate of change of position, so if you put all this together, you can start with knowing the position of an object uh, and what current velocity it's got. You can then work out how that will change, and that lets you work out where it will be in future. And this is how you calculate where your objects are in the next frame when you're computing your, your game logic. Uh, so one thing that you've hopefully seen when you study this was our velocity time graphs. Have you all seen velocity time graphs, get the idea of them? Oh gosh, maybe not. Uh, okay, well, all I'm saying is uh, a graph where you put time along the x-axis and speed or velocity along the y-axis. You know this kind of thing, don't you? Yeah. Um, they're just they're just very useful as a way of like thinking about what's going on in a dynamic system, right? Uh, so this is one that I just kind of plucked from somewhere in the world, and the thing you realise is that um, so as time is passing and the velocity is changing, it's kind of going up and down. Um, Sometimes what we actually care about, though, is like the, the final position of things, You know where they are. Right? Well, it's hard, does anyone know how do you work out the position? Like, I want to work out, if I know this and I say, I want to know what position is the guy at at time equals 100. How do I, what am I trying to do? It's kind of, there's like a, a kind of fairly direct answer that you would get from calculus or anything. You know what you're doing? No. Nope. You find the integral, exactly. You're trying to find the, the integral of this curve over the relevant period, right? You're trying to find the area under the curve. That's what you're doing, right? So when you work out the area under the curve, that's you basically adding up all of these small individual values. Um, so what you need to do is that for every unit of time, you work out how much distance was covered in that little unit of time, and you add that one up, and you add the next one up, and you add the next one up. You just keep a running total, and the running total tells you where you are from, from where you started, right? Um, I feel maybe I didn't explain it super well, but this is just the way it is, right? The velocity time graphs, area under the curve, that's how you work out positions of things. Uh, this particular one here is actually from a real a real thing. Um, by looking at it, do you have any clue as to what this might actually be the graph of? What, what event is it that would take this sort of amount of time and of all these sort of speeds? What about this this first part of it here, this section here? Is there anything kind of conspicuous about that? Very rapidly accelerating. So. Rapidly accelerating, yes, and then and then apparently kind of decaying here. And this this thing here, like it's a line, basically, right? So if it's a if it's a linear uh, speed graph, what does that tell you about the acceleration? Constant. Constant, right? Constant acceleration. And there's another little clue here. 
Um, if you look at the, the time spots along here, you see that that's 50. Every one of these dots has been dropped at 10 seconds. That's 50, 40, 30, 20, 10. So look here, after 10 seconds, the speed is about 100 meters per second. And after 20 seconds, it's about 200. And after 30 seconds, nearly 300, not quite. So what is the actual acceleration during this phase? Say it again? 10 meters per second. 10 meters, 10 meters per second per second. Yes. So this part here, this is an acceleration of about 10 meters per second per second. Because after 10 seconds, he's done 100. After 20 seconds, he's done 200. So 10 meters per second per second, that's a strangely familiar number. What, what would cause something to accelerate at 10 meters per second per second? Being free falling the gravity of the Earth. So we get any clues yet as to what's happening here? This is gravity. Yes. Yes. This is this is some idiot jumping out of a balloon at the top of the stratosphere. Um, so this is someone falling to the earth from space. And they actually did it. A guy called Felix Baumgartner, he did a space dive uh, where he went up in a balloon to, what was it, 40 kilometers or something like that? Um, uh, so here's the details here. And these are the actual the telemetry from his, from his jump. I think there's like a video here of it somewhere, but you know what it is. He, he just took a, took a balloon way up to the top of the atmosphere and then jumped out. Right? Just free fall. Uh, I mean, he had a parachute, right? He's not, he wasn't a complete <laughs> idiot. But uh, so the thing is, when you do that, what happens is you'll start accelerating under, you know, uh, gravity near Earth type acceleration. But it doesn't keep going. It doesn't keep getting faster and faster. So what happens here? See, that's what you think. You think it was open the parachute, but I believe it's not. Um, terminal velocity, right. What happens is um, when you're jumping up from space, there's basically, you know, next to no atmosphere. So there's no resistance. So you just fall, you know, like a like a stone. As you start to hit the atmosphere, though, you start to get air resistance and that builds up until eventually the force of the air buffeting up against you matches the gravitational force acting on you and it slows you down. And that's where you get something called terminal velocity, which is as, as fast as you're going to get because you've cancelled out the forces. But then as he gets further along, as you get deeper into the atmosphere, the atmospheric resistance increases and actually slows you down. So I think this whole curve is him actually uh, just been uh, breaking in the atmosphere. And I think it's at the end point here where he, he deploys the parachute, if I'm uh, remembering all this correctly. But anyway, so that's a velocity time graph of, uh, of someone experiencing gravity in a very real and powerful sense. Um, OK, so. Uh, Remember, why I'm telling you all this, I'm trying to just remind you of enough physics about gravity and forces and stuff to let you compute displacements, which are you know the distance and position from one unit of time to the next. Because in a game, that's what you do. You want to know, I was here, where am I going to be next? Uh, so uh, the total displacement is is just the kind of the sum of all the... Uh, well, the displacement is like the vector form of distance, right? It's just the... Uh, you know, you started here, you ended there. The, the line between them is your displacement, right? Um, so if you know the displacement, you can kind of work out the position. They're, they're the same thing. Um, now, you can't directly observe velocities and accelerations. If you just took like a photograph of something, you can just see its position. But you work out the velocity by comparing two photographs. That's how you know how fast it's going. Um, and you take that to the next level to work out the acceleration. You compare two velocities. So that's how it all works. Uh, and this is indeed calculating the area under the curve of a velocity time graph. Um, so in theory, under ideal circumstances, you could do this with calculus. You could actually compute integrals. It turns out in reality, the equations are, are too complex uh, to really admit to like nice, clean integrals. So you just do it using numerical integration which is where you just literally add everything up yourself instead of like solving an integral. So it's a bit like if you had a curve like this and you wanted to work out the area under this curve, which, as I'm saying, would be the distance that you've traveled, um, you could look, in theory, calculus would tell you exactly what the answer was. But all calculus is doing is it's basically summing up all these little green bars. But in calculus, you just make the green bars become like super, super small. Uh, and this is the idea that as, as your, uh, this would be the, your time step, right? As your time step gets smaller and smaller, 
you get closer and closer to these green values approximating the, the truth, right? Um, so in the case of a game, this is your frame rate. If you get higher frame rate, then the width of the green bars is smaller, uh, which means you're actually getting a more precise approximation to what would really go on in the world. It's always a little bit wrong, like in this part here, the green bars are always like underestimates of the red line, and over this part they're overestimates because of the way the you know the curve's increasing or decreasing. But this is the this is roughly what's going on. So when these blocks are like big and crude, that's running at a low frame rate, and when they're small and thin, that's running at a high frame rate. Okay, so that's sort of what's what's going on. Uh, so the smaller your steps are, the more accurate your, your answer will be, at least if you use this this technique. And it turns out this technique works by, you know, we're calculating the area of these things by using the value at the beginning of each time interval. And we're just extending that as if it were constant over the period, but it's not really constant. So it turns out instead of doing it this way, if you took the averages between the start and the end of the time step, so that these rectangles would become kind of wedges with little triangles on the top, that becomes a much better approximation. Um, it actually turns out if you do it that way, you can kind of get the same answer even if you use different time steps, which is the thing I'm trying to illustrate with the spaceships. Um, yeah, so these are, these are different ways here that you can use numerical integration to compute areas under curves. You can say, I'm going to take a bunch of little slices and each the height of each slice will be based on the, the value at the start of the, the time interval, and you get this approach. Or you can say, no, I'm going to use it based on the time at the end, if you somehow knew that in advance, and you would get this. Or you can say, no, I should use the midpoint. I should use what the value is in between the start and the end of a time interval. And this is the most accurate one. OK, um, so if we go back to talking about gravity near the surface of the Earth, ignoring air resistance, it turns out that you've got the very special case of uniform acceleration. So that's the part on the velocity time graph. It's just a line, you know, the, the, the beginning of Felix's jump. But it's dead simple, it's just, just a line, just getting constantly faster. Um, it turns out that that's a very simple velocity time graph. Right? That's what it looks like. And this is what like falling objects near Earth look like. And it's very easy to work out the area underneath this curve. Right? It's basically there's the area of a triangle, you know, half the base times the height. That's kind of what you're doing. Um, and we tend to assume uh, things like uniform acceleration when we're doing in games so that we can we can simplify things to calculating little triangular areas rather than doing anything hard. Uh, so this is how you do it. This is the, the algebra that you do to finally calculate the position of something if you've computed uh, in advance some kind of force. The final position is your initial position plus your average velocity over the time period that you care about. So this is the average velocity within like one frame multiplied by delta time. right? This is easy, right? Velocity times time uh, is uh, is distance covered. So you end up with your initial position plus how much you move by. So that's okay. The question is, what's average velocity? We don't we don't know that yet. Well, the average velocity is the average of your two of your initial velocity and your final velocity. Add them together divided by two. Average. It's not that hard, okay? So that's average velocity. So we need to know initial velocity and final velocity. Initial velocity you presumably know because it's the initial one. You, you know you remembered it. It's like it's you know your current velocity, right? How do you work at the final velocity? Well, the final velocity is your initial velocity plus how much you're accelerating by times the amount of time that you accelerated for. Again, it's fairly simple. It's just an add and a multiply. So that's how we work out the final velocity, uh, which we can do if we know the initial one, which I'm assuming we do. We know the delta time because your because your game main loop has told you what the delta time was because you measured it, right? So the only thing we don't know is the acceleration. And what's the acceleration? Well, f equals m a. If f equals m a, then a equals f over m. So this is just working backwards from like what we want to know. I want to know the position, and I'm kind of using basic dynamics to work out how do I get to calculate that. So I need to know the acceleration. That's force over mass. How do I get the forces? Well, you know. In the case of near near Earth, the answer is the force is g, the force is 10, um, or whatever you, need, you know you scale it by whatever units you're using in your game. Um, so basically, the force is just the sum of all the forces, which would be gravity, collision, magnets, whatever else you're doing. So it's only a few lines of code to basically let you work all this out. That's kind of what I'm trying to say. 
Um, and in fact, kids can do this. It turns out um, here's an example of uh, some of Kay's uh, uh, school kids trying to do this. Yeah. So obviously Aristotle never asked, will actually cut straight to the chase. Now, what if we want to look at this more closely? We can take a movie of what's going on, but even if we single step this movie, it's tricky to see what's going on. And so what we can do is we can lay out the frames side by side or stack them up. So when the children see this, they say, ah, acceleration. Remembering back four months when they did their cars sideways. And they start measuring to find out what kind of acceleration it is. And so what I'm doing is measuring from the bottom of one image to the bottom of the next image about a fifth of a second later, like that, and they're getting faster and faster each time. And if I stack these guys up, then we see the differences, the increase in the speed is constant. And they say, oh yeah, constant acceleration. We, we've done that already. And how shall we, uh, how shall we look and verify that we actually have it. So we can't tell much from just making the ball drop there. But if we drop the ball and run the movie at the same time. Right, so what they've actually done here is the kids have used this little programming language, which is kind of based on small talk, but made even simpler for kids. And they've written a simulation of a ball falling under gravity by using, these are the commands in the language, balls x speed increases by some number. And, you know, and this is just very simple, you know, adding stuff up, stuff. Uh, but the thing is, they, they write the little simulation and then run the simulation next to real video footage of the actual world, which is the empirical part of science, you know, where you look at stuff and they see, oh, look, my simulation and reality match up with each other, which means I've actually discovered something. It means that, you know, the laws that I'm simulating appear to be a bit like the laws that are actually active in the world. And this is kind of basically all I'm, I'm getting you to do with the spaceship. I've added a few complexities because you're grown ups, right? But that's it, we're just simulating forces, velocities, distances, uh, and you end up with a, a basic physics simulation of a spaceship. So that's homework part two, right? Um, so you add thrust to the spaceship, which we can rotate freely in space because that's how, right? Uh, I guess in theory, when you rotate, there must be side thrusters or something, but don't worry about it. Um, add, a add a toggle for gravity, so the gravity force can either be on or off. Uh, do the bouncing at the top and the bottom, just like I showed you in the video. Uh, and, uh, and have the wraparound stuff from the sprite. And then put two extra ships. Um, and as I've explained, I want the two extra ships. One of them will use... So your main ship is using delta T as its uh, update value. The second ship uses delta T over two, but it uses it twice. So that's basically, instead of computing one big step, you compute two smaller steps, two baby steps, as we would call them. And the third one, you use four steps, each of which is a quarter of the fullness. You use four baby, baby steps. And that's me showing you this idea about you know, how the, the, the delta T value changes the, the, way, the, the precision with which you're computing the area under the curve, right? But if you do it right and you use triangular wedges, um, you'll get the right answer, even though you're using different delta Ts. And this would mean that your game would behave the same way, whether it's running at 60 hertz or 30 hertz or 100 hertz. It would always be computing the same underlying behavior, um, which is only possible if you're able to compute the average velocity during each interval correctly. If you can't do that, you, you can't solve the problem, really. But in the case of uniform gravity, you can calculate the average velocity. Therefore, you can produce this way of uh, computing it so that you get the same answer no matter what frame rate you're running at, which turns out to be a nice property. Uh, which I'll try and explain maybe a bit more in the tutorial because it's, it's maybe not totally obvious. Um, oh yeah, the other thing is that the framework I've got for this, I always develop under Chrome um, and um, I've got the thing where you, know, you click the mouse and it follows the mouse. That apparently misbehaves in some of the other browsers because even to this day, uh, the browsers have got like slight inconsistencies in how they deal with certain things um, and I don't have time to fix it. So uh, if you're developing this, try and do it in, in a Chrome-derived browser. I think if you don't, what happens is that uh, the ship will follow your mouse all the time instead of just when you're clicking. 
uh, and I want it to look forward just when you click. So just bear that in mind, just a little wart that I uh, forgot about. Uh, the other thing that worth bearing in mind when you're doing all this, we're doing it in JavaScript. JavaScript is not the best language in the world for dealing with like vector math because you can't really create like a nice vector class. You might just want to have like a, a position vector where you do position plus. It's not really convenient to do that in JavaScript. So in JavaScript, you just have to do you know position dot x, blah blah blah, and then position dot y, and you have to kind of repeat yourself a little bit. But you've only got x and y, so it's not that horrible. So just instead of doing like nice vector types, you'll just have to use uh, um, individual x and y's because you don't because JavaScript doesn't let you do operator overloading or anything like that. Um, okay, so that's what I would recommend. Just use x and y as your member variables. And that is what I have to say about that. Um, yeah.